I'm excited for the, I've been excited about this morning for quite a while because this morning you get to hear the gospel according to Wills Clink. And uh, I heard the gospel according to Wills Clink several years ago at lunch, I think. And I just remember walking away thinking, yeah, I like Jesus a lot more now than I did just a couple hours ago. And Really, that's the point of every message, uh, that uh, we fall more and more in love with Jesus. So, Wills um, uh, is married to Catherine. How long has it been now? 11 months. 11 months. So, that's quite an improvement on Wills, that he got married to Catherine. And he can tell you more about himself. But uh, Wills uh, is, the thing I appreciate so much about Wills is Wills is genuinely a guy that doesn't believe that he's saved himself with his knowledge of Jesus. But he's convinced that Jesus has saved him and is saving him every moment. And so that's why I want you to hear from Wills. He can tell you more about his family and all of that. But let's, uh, yeah, come up here, Wills, and maybe we can just uh, pray, pray for you together, okay? So Lord God, I thank you that you have uh, breathed your spirit into wills over and over and over again. And that when you breathe your spirit into the, into the dust and into the dry bones, they rise and they, they walk into the land and uh, your land, which is your kingdom. And so, Lord, I thank you for how you've done that in Will's life and drawn him so close to yourself. I thank you for his tears when he leads in worship that, um, that speak you, Lord Jesus, his gratitude toward you. So I thank you, Lord, for how you've used Wills as a worship leader through, throughout his life in various capacities. But I thank you, Lord, for how you use Wills as a worship leader all the time, because uh, every time I see Wills, he wants to talk about how, how good you are, whether we do that with words or just a look. So, Lord, would you open our hearts so that the spirit you've poured into wills, your spirit would flow out of wills and to us and that it would all return to you as praise. So, Lord, thank you for wills. We bless him in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Let's pray real quick. Lord, we thank you for this morning. And we thank you for who you are and how we thank you even, Lord, for the complexity of who you are between you, the Father, in the Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior, and the Holy Spirit. And I believe that the Holy Spirit has an assignment and a, a purpose here this morning for all of us. So, Lord, let that be, and let your power be here, and let your Spirit be here with everybody in all things, Lord. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Uh, Sasha, if we can put up that slide. One of my favorite uh, verses in Scripture is this one, 2 Corinthians 3.18. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. Uh, ESV says, and we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. And I think in retrospect, do you all feel the Lord transforming you? I don't know if it's on a daily basis or a situational basis, that something will happen in your life that exposes more of the Lord to you, and you're being transformed. And I actually feel, I can feel the transformation even in retrospect as I looked at before I was saved. And I wasn't saved until I was about 36 years old, even though I should have been, and I'll explain a little bit that later. And I wish Peter would not have talked about the tears when I lead worship, um, the crying prophet and all that business. So I hope that doesn't happen this morning. But if the Spirit deems it so, the reason I, here we go. I get emotional because by the Spirit, I know how much God the Father loves us and how much Jesus loves us. And God the Father, Jesus, and the Spirit are all one. So how that happens, I really am still confused about. But anyway, I wanted to explain a little bit about myself first and then go into my testimony. Um, 
And you can take that down now if you want, Sasha. So, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I know the Holy Spirit uh, through intense experience with Him. And I think as I became a Christian, the Holy Spirit was involved from the beginning, and the Holy Spirit has been the biggest part of my experience of loving the Lord. Um, when I first got saved, um, there were, I was immediately immersed into the world of the Holy Spirit, and I uh, received the baptism of the Holy Spirit in fire in a small little assembly of God Church in Hendersonville, Tennessee. And it was amazing, I'll tell you. So I know the Holy Spirit from that uh, experience. And to me, the Holy Spirit holds the power here on earth. That he's the part of God that gives us the experience of power and the glory of the Lord. So I just rest in that. I know Jesus, my Lord and Savior, through... Uh, and I hate to say this too, but Jesus is kind of the last one that I got to know and love. I knew the Holy Spirit. I was easy to know the Father. I think I've always talked to the Father my whole life. But Jesus, later in life, I came to know as my Lord and Savior. I always knew that, but I didn't really know Jesus. It's like it was more experience with the Holy Spirit, more experience with the Father. And the Holy Spirit uh, revealed Jesus later on in life. So I know him as my Lord and Savior. Through him, all things were created and have their being, and he alone was God among us. He's a part of God that came to be with us and show us that the old covenant turns into the new covenant. And the glory they talk to about surpassing from one degree to another, and it comes from the Lord who is the Spirit, uh, the glory of the Lord is what transforms us. He alone sacrificed himself for us, atoned for our sins, and he alone will one day receive everything and make all things new. I know that that's one thing we believe here, and that's just so critical. Every knee and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord someday. I gave a copy of Peter's book, All Things New, to a Hindu this last week, and she was very receptive. I had some dental work done. She was my dentist. And she was just glad to hear about Christ and that we believe that her father is our father. And she received that. And I said, well, here's an explanation and told him how Peter was kind of a black sheep. And uh, she was very receptive to that. And then I found out later on that her assistant, as I shared my testimony, I was waiting for the Novocaine to kick in. And for some reason, and I know what the reason is, the Holy Spirit said this, uh, I just asked her, where are you at with Jesus? And it comes to find out she's a worship leader at an Assembly God church here in Denver. So I got a chance to give my testimony to her, and it was kind of a prelude to this. Um, I know my Heavenly Father, who is worshipped by all creation, waiting for the day of reconciliation to bring everything back to himself. By faith, knowing this story, that's what keeps me alive. I don't know how anybody can survive this world with having, without having Jesus. And um, his spirit is who gives us that. Uh, my name is Wills, you know that. Uh, my wife Catherine and I are members. Uh, we live in Brighton, and I have three kids and two grandkids here locally, and uh, we're newlyweds. There we are. Of course, I asked her to marry me long before this picture was taken, uh, but this is part of our uh, story. Um, we got married and made a covenant. We made our covenant vows flying over the Las Vegas skyline at night. And uh, I want to say that when we landed after, we took off and got set our vows in the air. And when we landed, it caused quite a stir. The helicopter caused a stir. <laughs> dad, dad joke. So there we are. That's after we made our I, do, our I do's to each other. My wonderful, beautiful wife who is a definitely a gift from God and one of the greatest things he's ever done for me. 
Uh, I'm a Merle Haggard fan. I'm a, also a Led Zeppelin fan. So I've got both. I know my brother Peter is uh, big on Led Zeppelin. Uh, I'm a Harley Davidson fan. Uh, I'm a Peter Hyatt fan. And I'm a big Jesus fan. Let's give a clap for Jesus. I've done some crazy things. That's not necessarily me, but... It's, 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 who, it's who I want to be, but that's quite the daredevil there. Uh, ridden some great motorcycles, and I still ride today. Uh, there's Catherine and I in front of our three-wheeled motorcycle. Now, I didn't know how I was going to tie this in, but I've been riding motorcycles since I was 16 years old. Had many different Harley Davidsons and have loved the whole thing. But two years ago, I was diagnosed with Parkinson's. I don't know how many of you know that, uh, but quite a few of you do. Uh, Jennifer and, and uh, Alan have been good friends of mine. Not to punch you out, Jennifer, at all, but you're my sister. Uh, Jennifer also uh, has Parkinson's. And so that's part of my transformation, though. That's part of my story. That's part of how the Lord encourages me. Um, I've been blessed and touched by God. So, to tell my story, I was born in Southern California, and uh, where we lived was across the street from us directly was 40 acres of orange grove. And as a little kid, I can remember, I must have been seven-ish, something like that. I remember running through the orange grove and the shadows and the light, it was a very magical place for me. And I became very um, imaginative. It uh, really boosted my imagination and I became very emotional. I'm a, as you can tell, I'm an emotional, imaginative person. So uh, that was a big part of living in the Orange Grove. And in retrospect, I think that the Holy Spirit was with me during those days, even before I knew who he was. Um, I can look back now and, and see where God held my hand in those orange groves. Uh, in Southern California until I was in the fifth grade. And then in the sixth grade, we, my father was a police officer. And he took a job as a chief of police in a small town in Alaska. And so I was on an island. The only way on or off was either by boat or by airplane. There was no roads in or out. It was Wrangell, Alaska. I don't know if, if you guys know where that is. But for the first time in my life, a sixth, seventh grade junior high schooler, we started to go to church. We had not been a religious family. Didn't know what church. I knew people went to church, but then I... That's about all I knew. So when we moved to Alaska, there was not, as a little bitty town, there, those, there were two kind of groups of people and only basically two things to do. Either you were the church people, that was the activity in the community that you belonged to, or you were the tavern people. So, of course, with my dad being the chief of police, the natural thing for us to do would be part of the church people. So for the first time, I started going to a little Presbyterian church in Wrangell, Alaska. And that's where I got to know who Jesus was, who the Father was. I didn't talk much about the Holy Spirit. My father used to joke and say that the Presbyterians were the frozen chosen. <laughs> so there wasn't much uh, uh, of that business going on at all. Um, so that was my first time in church. After three years, uh, my father announced to the family that he was going into the ministry. We're like, what? So we moved from Alaska as between my uh, junior high school year, which would have been eighth grade and ninth grade high school. And we could have gone to a seminary three different places. He, and he was approved. I, I don't know how that works. He was approved to go. But we could have gone to Berkeley, California, which who knows how I would have handed up if we would have been in Berkeley in the early 70s. Uh, Someplace in Kentucky, I don't know if it was Bowling Green or what, I don't know if you know where the Presbyterian seminaries are. Yeah, I think Knoxville. Knoxville. And uh, Dubuque, Iowa. 
which is where we ended up. And I went to high school in Dubuque, Iowa. Uh, church experience for me when my dad was in that period of time was not good. And I want to preface this and be very careful about how I say this. Not to say that all churches are like this or all leadership is like this. Um, My dad was my hero, especially as a police officer. He was, you know, six foot three and weighed 250 pounds and he was a big guy. But he was, and in his uniform, he was my hero. And now we were in Iowa. He was not a cop. He was a student in seminary. But as he was, <laughs> I can't do this. As he was in seminary, my first experience was with the church. We're experiencing physical violence and abuse from my father. (laughs) And I thought all these guys were supposed to be God. The senior pastor for the Presbyterian Church, my dad was an associate. Got to know him and his wife, been over to the house for dinner and thought he was a great guy. And the next thing I know, he was leaving the church because... uh, he was leaving his wife because he had had an affair with the church secretary. And so here's one of, one of my leaders. It didn't make sense. And then I'll tell you one example, but I used to get smacked around a lot when I was in high school by my father. And I love my father, don't get me wrong, and we have since he's long passed away. Uh, but we did make amends and forgiveness before he was gone. But as an example of the extremeness of this, we were tight on money, I understand that, but I was with my girlfriend, I was 14. With my girlfriend was over at our house and we needed some milk. So my father gave me, I can't remember if it was $3 or what it was back then, and sent us down to the corner store to buy milk. And by mistake, I had bought whole milk instead of 2% milk, which is probably 25 cents more. Uh, So we got back home. And uh, (laughs) he counted the change. And man, it was like 30 cents less than what he expected to get back. And he goes, where's the rest of the change? And I said, I don't know. He reached out with the back of his hand and he slapped me so hard that I fell to the floor and my nose immediately started to bleed. And I was laying on the floor bleeding and this all in front of my 14 year old girlfriend totally emasculated me. And I was... I couldn't make sense of it. It was like, Lord, all these people that profess to love you and have love in their hearts. It didn't make sense. Also, I found out later in life that my father was also having an affair with a fellow student who was over at our house all the time. We called her... Well, I won't use any names, but we used to call her aunt, and she was my sister's best friend. At the same time, she was sleeping with my father under my mother's nose. But you know, women know. My mother uh, gained a lot of weight. She got uh, neurotic, didn't want to go out in public anymore, and got depressed over the whole thing. I didn't also get any life advice from my father, any any words about Jesus or what Jesus meant to him. Nothing about life, about relationships with women, finances, sex, any of that kind of stuff. 
Although my dad's dad died when he was three. I'm not making any excuses for him, but he didn't really have a father either, so. That's kind of the world I was living in. I went into the Navy. Uh, actually, I left high school. They, he got a church in Nebraska and in my senior year. I was out on my own and stayed with a friend and finished up high school and had pre-enlisted in the Navy and wanted to follow my father and my grandfather's footsteps. So I went to the Navy for four years. And I also saw God's hand in retrospect moving on me then. There were a couple of incidents. I was an air crewman in a P-3 Orion. We were an anti-submarine uh, squadron. And there were a couple of times where I came in within seconds of being not with you anymore. But I see God's hand with just how circumstances happen. You know, this happened, this reaction happened in an avoided tragedy. So I could see God's moving back then too. Um, I played music the whole time and I went into, uh, kind of got out of the Navy. I was a police officer for a couple of years because I followed my dad's footsteps but I was way too loosely wrapped for those guys. Uh, so I ended my police work and uh, got into fire protection but at the same time I played in the band or a band or several bands but I was pretty wild and crazy, believe it or not. Um, I had music in mind, had many relationships. I was because of, I don't know why, but I was in and out of many relationships. I've been married several times. When, and finally married to Catherine, she's my hope. And I've finally mature enough to appreciate my wife and that she's a gift from God. Um, but I experienced a lot of heartache. Uh, ended up living in Nashville, Tennessee with an old Navy butter, an old Navy friend of mine. I uh, found success locally with the band that I was in. Uh, my stage name was Dr. Mitty. I don't know if any of you know what Mitty is. Look at that guy. <laughs> this is, a, I was probably 30 something right there. That's me, believe it or not. Who knows what I was thinking, but uh, this is my band days. It was a very theatrical band. But again, it was, uh, I'm sure I don't get ahead of myself. Uh, I was a big fish in a small, pan, a small pond in Nashville. I think most of the musicians in Nashville knew who I was. The band played in the biggest clubs, famous clubs in Nashville. And it was kind of an alternative rock band. It wasn't country. Uh, but we went in and out close to a couple of music deals, so I went through all that stuff. Um, I definitely li lived a life of sex, drugs, and rock and roll, um, which is just what it is. I'm unembellished, but I dated strippers. Uh, I was into the whole, I was into the world of the world. I was very much of the world and uh, very unhappy. In the meantime, I might have appeared to be happy. I drove a taxi cab from six at night to six in the morning for a couple of years to support myself. And there's an old saying that nothing good happens after midnight. I don't know if anybody's ever heard. Have I got that right? Anyway, we'll make it a saying if it's not one already. But <laughs> as you can imagine, between midnight, I used to work till 6 in the morning. So that period of time from 10 o'clock at night till 6 in the morning was nothing but evil. So that's part of it. I just wanted to paint a picture of what I went through. Um, it was a world that was fast, but it was empty. And one day I met a gal that was from California um, that stole my heart. She was the, I don't know, bigger than life maybe would have been the thing. And I picked her up as a cab fare with a bunch of other gals from California that were in Nashville for a convention. And basically, she and I ended up spending the next three days that she was at the, she didn't stay at the hotel, she stayed with me. And uh, it was bigger than life. I thought, oh man. And after three days, I asked this girl to marry me. I said, don't, you're going back to California. So don't, you don't have to answer me now, but I want you to know where my heart is. And I was sincere about it. I said, please marry me. And after the third day, she left me a little note on a napkin and lipstick and wrote, yes. And that went into uh, 
period of whirlwind time, basically to cut the story short, I uh, quit the band that I was in, put all my stuff in storage. I had a 1972 Cadillac that I parked in my bandmate's uh, driveway because I didn't know how long it was going to be gone. I ended up being gone for a long time. Uh, but we ended up falling in love. Uh, her father, for example, uh, spent $6,000 just on the photography alone. We got married, and one of my cousins is very well off, lives in a mansion uh, up on top of, in Malibu, California, up on the top of the hill, up above Zuma Beach is where we got married. And it was a picture-perfect big wedding. She had eight bridesmaids. And it was what I thought, and to be honest with you, what I was basing that marriage experience and who I thought she was the best person in the world is because the sex was fantastic. That's what my grounding was. It wasn't Jesus, it wasn't the Lord. Uh, it was a physical relationship that I thought was fantastic and I couldn't live without. So anyway, we had this uh, wonderful wedding uh, and ended up after the wedding, we went down to a uh, resort in, in uh, oh, I can't remember, down, down by uh, Oxnard. And on my wedding night, this woman that I had this wonderful physical relationship was, that I was basing on everything was, uh, we got married that night on our marriage night. Uh, my wife denied me. Uh, she just wanted to go to bed by herself. And I don't know if that makes sense or not, but she threw me for a real loop. And for the next six weeks, we didn't have any physical relationship at all. And I asked her what was wrong. We met in Nashville and she sat on my lap on the rocker and on the front porch and explained to me that she felt more safe than she ever had before. And she didn't want to ever be anywhere else. And as soon as we got married, there was, she didn't want to have anything to do with me. She did this to a, a second guy after me anyway. So long story short, she's just mentally not right. But it broke my heart. And um, I was broken. I didn't have any joy. I was empty. And didn't know what else to do. So a good friend of mine, and I had been living in California and uh, received a lot of praise over music and, and the music that I had written and made good friends that were big in the music business. Um, so my good friend who, uh, yeah, I shouldn't name names, but anyway, was in a, a very big band and I called him up and I said, hey, this is what's going on. And he said, I can't believe that. And I'm like, me either. I need to go. And I had called my parents in uh, Washington State at the time. And uh, they were understanding. They said, come up here and heal if you want to. And I said, okay. Called the guy, who that's his, you won't tell from his last name, who uh, took me to the Greyhound bus station in Los Angeles, California, downtown LA. So I don't know if you can paint a picture of that in your mind. Um, said goodbye, good luck, or whatever. And I remember being the first one on the bus, the Greyhound bus in Los Angeles. And I went to the back of the bus. I went all the way back to the back seats, back by the bathroom. I learned since then that's not the best place to sit on a Greyhound. Um, but I was broken. And... Sitting there in my despair, I watched the guys put my head, a cardboard box about this tall, with all my stuff in it underneath the bus, headed for Washington. And I was empty. I don't know how better to put that. There was just nothing left. So I sat on the bus, and all of a sudden, I felt the overwhelming presence of God. I didn't ask for it. I wasn't at some big revival meeting where people were excited and there was an altar call. I'd been to several of them before and hadn't ever ran down front. But uh, out of nowhere, God came to me. I didn't ask for him. I felt the overwhelming presence of the Lord. I felt heat. 
I felt like I was on fire and I felt pinned to my seat. And God came to me. I didn't go to him. And he loves us that much. No matter what your pain is, what your stuff is, or what you're in the middle of, God will come to you. And he was good enough to be gentle and knowing, but I knew that it was him. So at that point, that's where I got saved at 36 years old, by myself, on that bus. I raised my hand and accepted the Lord as my Savior. I said, okay, God, from now on, it's me and you. And that's been 30 some odd years ago. And I thank God for that. Six months later, I was back in Nashville. And like I said before, I received, among other things, this is six months being a baby Christian. I was baptized by fire, by the Holy Spirit. And I won't go into stories about that too much. But uh, my deliverance with being baptized by the Holy Spirit was done by, and I will mention his name, I don't know if he's alive still or not, is a preacher called Charles Carran, who was an ex-Baptist preacher. So he came from a Baptist background with the black suits and the little skinny tie and all that kind of stuff. But he had an experience that also baptized, baptized him in the Holy Spirit. So within six months, I was running around with the charismatic crowd. Would that be the right bunch? Yeah. And I've seen miracles, and I've seen the Holy Spirit heal people. Peter's experienced that before. I think your leg grew or something like that in Toronto. Uh, but I, I was also quickly asked to be on a prayer team. And I'm like, what, me? I'm only six months into this. I don't qualify. And I did under the anointing of another guy named Randy Clark. Uh, I also experienced, uh, during that first meeting, Charles Carr and I got baptized by the Holy Spirit in a little assembly of God church in Henderson, Tennessee. And it was explained to me by my friends, don't look at the signs and wonders. It's not like you've bought a ticket to the carnival. Just focus on God. But it was hard not to focus on some of the other stuff going on because there was stuff going on I had never seen before. And it was hard to believe, but it was God moving. Um, during that week, I had the experience of uh, uh, helping with the deliverance of a 14-year-old boy who had been at the service. And after, you know, you hear the message and then there's prayer time and people come forward and you lay hands on them and different things happen. Uh, this kid manifested. He was growling and his face was contorted and he was all bundled up and his hands were bunched up. And Charles was praying for him and he looked up at me and this is me, six-month Christian, looked up at me and says, you're on this one. And I'm like, what? <laughs> he goes, yeah, just get down here, put a hand on his stomach, put a hand on his head, and you just pray that by the Holy Spirit that the power of God come on this kid, which I did. And sure as heck, God showed up. About 20 minutes later, I could just feel the Holy Spirit move like, whoosh, like, a, like a gust of wind through us. And... Uh, the boy immediately relaxed, his hands relaxed, his face relaxed, the contortion went away, and he opened up my eyes. Or he, well, he did open up my eyes. Uh, but he opened his eyes up and said, what's going on? And I said, well, you know, you've been oppressed by something or whatever, and we prayed in Christ to set you free. And we hugged, and he went away. But the best part about this is... About five minutes later, I was still kind of standing around in awe, just watching what God was doing. And uh, this little girl, about five years old, came walking through the people up the aisle. And she comes up to me and she goes, are you the man that helped my brother? And I said, well, honey, I said, uh, I didn't help your brother. God, Jesus helped your brother. And she just looked at me with the most innocent eyes. And she looked at me and she goes, thank you. 
And I'll never forget that thank you. Uh, it was wonderful and very touching. Talked about impartation. Oh, also spend valley time and we don't have enough time to do. What, t- what time am I supposed to be done? Five or 10 minutes. Five or 10 minutes, I better hurry up. Um, so anyway, I've been through valleys. Uh, in part of my ministry, I got too full of myself. Um, I did um, a music ministry called the Judah Project and played in churches throughout uh, the United States and Canada. I got mixed up in sin in the middle of all that. I was traveling by myself. Uh, and I got sat down in the valley. Uh, God took away my anointing for worship and took away my involvement for, actually it was 14 years. Um, which I thought at seven, you know, it's a number of completion. I thought I'd be done at seven, but God decided to double that. And I decided, well, you double portion, you know, here we go. 14 years in the valley, but he lifted me up again. And part of that had to do, that was part of the time that I was involved with, with Peter. Uh, Peter Height was there for me when I was in trouble and very limited with what I could do. Uh, and God was again transforming me from glory to glory, and I can see that happening. Uh, so there have been new ministries and worship happening in my life as I've been transformed. One of them is being involved in worship again. He, he uh, not only allowed me to be a worship leader again, but the anointing was even stronger. And as you know, I've been uh, helping with worship here for several years. Also, Kate and I, I call her Kate, sorry, this is Catherine, are involved in a motorcycle ministry called the Black Sheep. And it's a group that we're all Harley riders and we cater to uh, Harley Davidson, that crowd, including the 1% bad guys that look like they would eat babies for lunch. But we're available and we share the gospel and the fact that Jesus loves them in spite of their not so godly ways. So that's been a rewarding. Um, Wanted to let you know too about uh, prophecy that was spoken over me. It sounds like it's about me, but it's not. I was uh, at a meeting in Nashville and um, uh, the preacher was talking about the sons of thunder. And I don't know if anybody have heard of that prophecy, anybody? And, and I want to say it was James Ryle, but that could be wrong. Um, was it? Uh, who's a local guy too, right, Ted? Yeah, up at the Boulder Valley Vineyard. Yeah, Boulder Valley Vineyard. So anyway, these vineyard guys, they're just all about the Holy Spirit. So anyway, it was prophesied about the sons of thunder who were, in essence, it was not one person, it was many people uh, that were anointed to spread the gospel of Christ and his return, specifically that Christ was coming back. And God was ministering to me that I was one of these guys. And in the visions, I'll shorten this story up a little bit, but one of the visions was there were many musicians across the stage and all of the musicians, the instruments were all blue. The drums were blue, the guitars were blue, the saxophone was blue, everything was blue. So I don't know if you notice that I play a blue guitar, but I'm operating within what I believe to be the uh, authority of, of that uh, prophecy of being one of the sons of thunder. I've even got a tattoo on my shoulder that says so. But I didn't know. I was confused. I'm like, am I? Is, how big of my ego would be to believe that I'm one of these guys that's supposed to sit and tell you that Jesus is coming back? So I was really wrestling with that. And at the time, and, and not to be racial, but I want to try and paint an accurate picture, I was dating a beautiful, she was gorgeous, but she was a black gal in Nashville, and of course her family was black. So I went to pick her up on a Friday night, and uh, we were going to dinner, but her family, and it was their custom on Friday night to gather the neighborhood together in the house and have church. They even had a little pulpit they would roll out and uh, have church. 
So she's like, do you want to go to dinner or do you want to stay here? And I'm like, we're staying here. I want to see what goes on, you know, because I was right in the middle of all this stuff. And again, the prophecy of, of uh, going on. And so everybody had to take a turn. And that's how it went, how they did church. You either had to have a song or a piece of scripture or a word or something. But one at a time, the 20 people that were in there uh, would do that. So anyway, after we were all done, her grandmother, if you can picture this frail black woman that looked like you could blow her over with just a, with glasses about this thick, but she was doing one of these things, looking through her glasses, just eyeing me. She was giving me the eyeball. And I was like, what is up with this? Granny staring at me. Um, but she came walking over. She came walking to me. And of course, I saw that happening. I felt obliged to go to her too. But she took me by the hands. And uh, as soon as she did, she started to quake. And her eyes started to flutter. And she goes, oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. And then she opened up her eyes and she looked at me. She goes, I didn't know anything about the prophecy. And I was looking for confirmation. She goes, when I touched your hands, I, felt, I heard the sound of thunder. And she said, it's like a thousand hoofbeats of horses. She said, the procession has already left heaven. And that Jesus in the wedding procession was indeed on its way. Now, I don't know what God's time was. This is 20 years ago. But who's, what's 20 years to God? It could have been two seconds ago or something like that. But she said, I hear the sound of thunder. And like, does that mean anything to you? And I'm like, yes. So that was my confirmation that especially in a situation like this where we're all together and you, of those of you online, be encouraged. Because the message is that Jesus is coming. We can count on that. That's his promise. And there's going to be nothing like it when he makes all things new. So be encouraged and be filled. Call your spirit forward to be with the Holy Spirit and have an open dialogue with him. Yield to the spirit and he'll speak. I hear his voice all the time. He speaks clearly to me. It's not an audible voice or anything, but he gives me deep impressions on things to either say to other people or pray for other people. And one of the gifts the Spirit has given me, and I don't know if you know about this or not about me, is that I hear angels singing when we do worship. And it's not all the time, but I definitely hear the chorus from heaven. And that's been a great thing. And God can do that for you too. So submit yourself to behold the glory of the Lord and cherish being transformed into the image of the Lord with nothing to hide from. That's like, can we put the slide up again, Sasha? Because we all, with unveiled face, it's not like the old days for Moses. If you want to find out more about this, just start to read in 2 Corinthians 3. There's the old covenant and the old glory where they used to have to put a veil over their face. But we don't have to do that anymore. We have great open communication with the Lord. And that's with glory that surpasses the glory of Moses. When Jesus came, it just knocked that glory of Moses right out of the water. Is that a, hopefully an accurate thing to say? But Christ is with us. So be encouraged. And I wonder if we could pray again right before I get done. Are we good? We're like quarter after. So let's pray. Lord, I know that you want to impart yourself this morning. And it doesn't have to be a big anything. There's no model it's not like I'm going to ask for everybody to stand up and come running down front to get hands on prayed for. But God can impart his spirit to you sitting where you're at. So if you're open to it, God wants to give you more. And Holy Spirit, I pray that you would come now and impart yourself. Give them more, Lord. Lord. Open your heart to say yes to Jesus and to his spirit. And he'll give that to you.
And he'll transform you even to another glory. So I thank you for that, Lord. Pour out your spirit right now in Jesus' name. Fill them up, Lord, with your spirit and direction. And I thank you for all these people here. I thank you for the people that are online. And I thank you for my story, Lord. And I ask for the glory of who you really are by your spirit and through Jesus Christ, our Savior, would give us all more. And I thank you for that, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Will. Thank you, guys. <laughs> uh, in, the, in the first chapter of John, John Rice said, no one's ever seen God. The only God in the bosom of the Father, he has made him known. And then Paul says that we've seen the glory of God shining in the face of Christ. And so the face of, and Jesus said, if you've seen the Father, you've, if you've seen, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And so on the night that he was betrayed by all of us, he took the bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body given to you. Take and eat and do this in remembrance of, of me. Uh, Remember what I look like. Remember my face. And he took the cup, saying, This is the covenant in my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you, and do it in remembrance of me. Um, uh, and they knew that the life was in the blood. And St. Paul says, uh, The Spirit is the life. And when Jesus uh, suffered and, and died in the morning on the tree, he delivered up his spirit, and that spirit descended upon the church. And uh, we're all baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And baptism means immersion. Uh, so people have different experiences. And uh, there have been times when it just was overwhelming to me that I'm immersed in the spirit, and, and I know it. Um, and so we're all baptized with that idea and ask for God to give us all of his, immerse us in the Spirit as much as possible. But we also come to this table for a face-to-face -face in, encounter. And I was reading, I was just reading this psalm, Psalm 104. It says, when you hide your face, the psalmist is saying, Lord, when you hide your face, they are dismayed. And he's talking about God's creatures. When you take away their breath, their ruach, they expire, they die, and return to their dust. When you send forth your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the Adama, the ground, Adama. And that's what you are, uh, ground that the Lord has breathed his spirit into, and we all hold our breath in fear, right? We seize control of the life and try to make our lives work. And so when we come to this table, it's uh, like we're expiring and being inspired by God. So to come to this table is to confess yourself to God, that I've tried to seize control of my life and make it work, and I can't. Um, and uh, so we expire. We, we confess ourselves, our sin. And at this table, he inspires us. He breathes that breath back into us. And we become his body in this world. So as you come to the table this morning, as you worship, um, expire like Will's just expired in front of all of us. And then allow God to inspire you. And allow God to fill you. And he is all around you and uh, invite his spirit to fill absolutely everything to be baptized in him. In other words, uh, worship, worship him. Um, this is mouth to mouth resuscitation, face to face in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord God, that I am yours and you are mine. Uh, Y'all know what the name Jesus means, right? It means God is salvation. And uh, the word Lord means controls everything. 
that's the boss, all right? So just do me this favor, if you would, and you, and you, you just need to actually believe this a little bit. Just say at the count of three, Jesus is Lord. Okay, ready? One, two, three, Jesus is Lord. Scripture says that you can't do that except by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so whenever someone shares a testimony about the things the Holy Spirit has done in their life, that used to always stress me out uh, because I would think, okay, well, maybe the Holy Spirit's not in my life. And then I would take so much comfort in the fact that, oh, I just confess that. And then I w when I was baptized, I mean, I think I've probably been baptized in the Spirit a bunch of times because it means being immersed in the Spirit and the Spirit's all around us. God did hold me down. And this is what he told me. He said, you stop doubting my love for you. <laughs> and he pulled back the curtain on all reality and I realized that he was everywhere loving me and I had just been blind to it. And so I hope you know that he's everywhere loving you. And I hope that you would keep calling on the name of the Lord and say, God, just baptize me, immerse me in your spirit and uh, write your love story in me. And that's what he's doing in all of us. And my hope is that um, the more we believe that God really is salvation and that he really is Lord, the less and less we'll be intimidated by each other's stories. And the more and more we'll rejoice in the fact that God is writing all these beautiful stories that are going to come together for his glory. And the more we'll surrender ourselves to him and the more he'll gain, uh, he'll he already controls everything, but he's gentle with us, and uh, he asks us to surrender to him. So all I'm really saying is believe the gospel. And you see, the gospel is Jesus is Lord. God is salvation, is the boss. In his name, amen.